Um, it's, it's a real privilege to be asked to speak today and give the keynote uh, presentation. Um, and the topic being um, uh, adolescent concurrent disorders, um, which is near and dear to my heart because a significant part of my work involves uh, working with young people. Um, and, you know, now this far through my career, I've had young people that I've followed over the years um, and I've seen them grow and develop. And in thinking about how to put together this presentation, I had thought about um, putting together PowerPoint um, and going through the epidemiology as we normally do and talking about um, numbers and statistics and then um, pharmacology approaches, et cetera. But I feel like that's less important. And um, there's nothing in that regard that I can present today that the audience can't look up in a paper or a book to understand. Um, what I think is more important is to um, involve people with lived experience and really talk about the journey that some young people may um, undergo uh, when it comes to growing up with all the pressures and challenges that young people face, but also how that interplays with mental illness and addiction. Um, so having said that, um, I'm very fortunate that one of my patients, Nicholas, has very graciously um, agreed to um, join me today for the presentation and to share his experience. Um, and really, um, Nicholas, I'm super grateful. I, I understand, you know, it's not easy to um, come in front of an audience and share some of your most intimate and private aspects of your life. Um, so I really appreciate you coming here. Um, and uh, uh, let's just jump right into it if, if you're ready. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Okay, perfect. Um, so Nicholas, I won't give you much more introduction um, in terms of uh, your background, but what I want to ask starting out is, can you describe um, what it was like at, let's just call it the height of your addiction? Um, maybe some of the substances you were struggling with, but also maybe um, your social circumstance as, as well as um, if there was any uh, element of mental illness at play as well. Oh, yeah, there was uh, mental illness absolutely at play. Um, I, uh, I, I got a diagnosis of, of schizophrenia when later on, but um, I me mean, as most of the, most of the time I was, I was, I had to, I, I was, I had to be alert and ready because I was, I always thought there was people coming to get me. At, at the at the worst time at the height of addiction like I, I would I'd it was I would do the drugs and the drugs would cause the was would cause the psychosis but then I would have to do more because I would feel that I have to be prepared in case something was happening that wasn't the, the main reason though there was other reasons too but that was that was a lot of nights were like that they were like um people uh, I was checking the blinds checking the front yards checking the backyards doing the doing the dope then going back and doing the same thing over and over again for out for weeks hours and same with my car I would drive my car places to thinking trying to get away using dope and then drive somewhere else and then yeah it was... yeah I mean you're really describing a scene out of Breaking Bad isn't it where where you're stuck in this cycle of using substances experiencing that intense paranoia the psychosis, and then coping by using more substances. So, so um, paint the picture for us. Um, you're in Vancouver. Um, and what is your situation like um, in terms of like where you're living, uh, who you have around you, um, and um, and what substances you're using? I, oh, oh at, well, at that point, I was in more of a rural area. Got it. Um, that, but there was also, when I was in Vancouver, bef right slightly before that, um, well, let's let's back up. Let's, let's talk about the the, the rural uh, area that you were living in. What was that like? And I, I suspect that's where the height of the substance use was possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Paint that picture for us. So I was working in construction. I was getting underpaid, overworked, but I still had lots of money, and um, I was just I was coping with the pain with 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 uh, with with heroin use and cocaine use. Um, I was using it intravenously and basically that's, that's all, that's the only place my money went. It was like, it was do work, get high, 
freak and have paranoid and paranoid in, um incidents is that's very much what my life was it, there wasn't much more to it there was a few times where i go to other people's houses and use there and but um that's pretty much it was pretty much on a loop and i wasn't going anywhere okay okay so this this intense cycle of cocaine use uh i i followed by paranoia psychosis and was was the heroin used to come down from the cocaine then that was that was it wasn't it wasn't I wasn't like getting it was that was mostly because I've had an opiate problem for 15 years where I've had to at least maintain so I don't get sick so it wasn't like a it wasn't like using it. that to get high I was using that just so I didn't feel sick you know, just buying wow. small amounts of that it was mostly the cocaine use okay okay um and I do want to um shortly uh back up a little bit and and for you to paint a picture of what it was like growing up and how you were introduced into the substances but now that you've painted this picture of working construction using substances experiencing psychosis um and since you brought up the psychosis can we just quickly delve into the psychosis you talked about feeling paranoid but maybe paint us a picture of what somebody with that level of psychosis experiences I was I was hearing people talk about me like they were planning plotting um that they were coming to get me like that and like I at this point I knew it wasn't real like I know it was in my head but it didn't stop me from having to prepare in case it wasn't because it put those thoughts in my head well what if I'm what if I'm just really what if I've like just like I'm just foreseeing something that is going to happen here like what if my it's my intuition so it didn't stop me from playing those event, those, those 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 hallucinations as real life events, because like and prepping for them in another word. Yeah, and when you say hallucinations, for for those of us, uh, those of us in the audience who may not uh, be aware, is we're not talking about just sort of thoughts, right? I, I suspect. It's, yeah, I, I heard. I hear it. It was. It was. It was heard like I can I can hear it just but I can hear it clearly like it was listening through my ears like it wasn't it wasn't visual or anything like that it was it was things that I heard like that and, and, yeah, and it wasn't they weren't just thoughts no <laughs> and what what were they saying um like I, I everything just anything that was like that I could be a um like any weakness that I had anything that could be like any way that something something that I was like unsure about or worried about, it would attack that. It would it would that's what um it would be it would be about that. And I can't think of the specifics because it's been it would be either like if I owed somebody money they were pissed off or like if I um if I could possibly have made someone upset they were coming to get me, uh anything like that like just it was just, it's just everything anything that you, I could have been unsure about would be attacked and it was it was a man's voice woman's voice two voices there's always two Obviously. um and they were always discussing it sometimes there would be one that would be like slightly less aggressive than the other but it was it was always two it was never one M men's voices or most of the time but sometimes like it was like a it was like a one was like a it could i think a woman's voice but it was mostly like a like an, a higher pitch and a lower pitch like there was okay. i you couldn't always tell if it was a man or a woman it just it didn't really matter it was more of the subject matter that was important that. so attacking you but also talking about bad things that might happen yeah like just anything like just like every con like if i had a, a interaction with someone especially if it was a bad interaction with someone if if I afterwards, I'd be thinking about that for weeks. I'd be thinking about like, and then it would just grow into something, into a huge problem until I would like approach the person very delicately because I know it's, I know I was, I knew I was having psychosis and I'd have to like feel out to make sure that it was all, it was, there was nothing happening, which there usually was, like there wasn't. And it would, and it would, it would then I would get a relief. I'm like, okay, there's nothing going on. I'm, I'm just, just in my head. And then it would get, I get, I would get, uh, I get like a time where it would be, it would calm down a bit and, and I wouldn't have to worry about that situation, but there'd be something else then next, something else would come up. Uh, I mean, it sounds terrifying. It sucked. It's still, well, it's, it's, it still sucks, but it's not anywhere near as bad. And it, and yeah, it, it was, it just, it just would shut up. It was, it was awful, <laughs> but it's, right. it's a lot better now. Okay. 
Right. Um, okay. Well, I mean, you did a beautiful job of painting us a picture of, of what you were experiencing at that time with the psychosis. Um, were there episodes where you would, your behavior would change because of the voices? For instance, like you said something about getting into a car and trying to drive away or? Yeah, like, because I couldn't be in my house because if I was in my house, there could, like, in my head, it sounds ridiculous to me for now, but it's, there could be microphone, there could be microphones listening and there could be people around, like, in, in my car driving away, it was like, at least I know that I, it's, it's me, I'm just hearing stuff, I'm not, it was easier to, to prove to myself that that stuff wasn't real, but wow. if I was out somewhere where I never would be, I just see. like, yeah. Got it. Okay. Okay. So you were sort of proving to yourself that that this couldn't possibly be real, but yeah, home. It's like there's microphones around. There's the, yeah, you know, there could be there like there could be like um I've seen people do some terrible stuff. So like you know it's it, it, like not that that was happening. It was just mm -hmm. I don't I never put it past people that they can't that people can't do stuff like that. Got it. Got it. Okay. Okay. Um. But life wasn't always like this for you, I suspect. No, no. Um, let's just take a few minutes and go back to your childhood growing up. What was that like? It was pretty good. Like, I, I, my childhood was good. I had really great parents. They were loving and caring. Like, I didn't have any, they were, they were really, really great parents. And uh, I wouldn't, um, and the only one, like, not, nothing about them, but like, uh, I, was, I did graduate early. I graduated when I was 17. So uh, I moved to I moved to Vancouver from a rural area and I was uh, I was alone. So I uh, just got into groups of random strangers. And, and, and Nicholas, um, I think what you're um, getting to is, is super important because um, th that the need for a community when you moved out into Vancouver and being alone, I really want to go there. But just stepping back again, just yep. walk me through your so childhood is, is good. You know, you're having a nice what you would expect a, 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 as a, as an idyllic childhood in a rural community um growing yeah. um like i was everybody like i was teased i'm short i i'm a, i like technology i'm kind of a nerd like i i there was bullying but i don't know if it how much it really could have affected me like it might have i don't think it helped my paranoia and my psychosis at all because i do looking back on it i do know that i had like traces of it back then now that i look at it of um of paranoia for sure but um and uh like i, I don't think i was like too, i have adhd so school was hard i guess it was it was it was hard because of the the, the structure of how they want to teach you not because i wasn't i could i didn't get it so uh, there was always the issues with teachers and stuff like that with uh of the way they wanted you to learn something wasn't the way that I learned things. So right. there was always, there, there was always problems. I already, I did have, I did have problems, I guess, but I wouldn't, I've seen, I would think a lot of people might have it worse than I did. Okay. But, okay. But fair enough. I mean, you're, you're describing this picture of a super smart kid who's really into technology, um, but maybe struggles um, sitting still in class and, and, and <laughs> learning, learning while the teacher's talking. So getting trouble by, by the teachers at the same time, the kids around him might be teasing him because he's smart and he likes technology and he's labeled as a nerd and maybe he's shorter in stature than the other kids. Did, so um, so some challenges growing up. Did you have friends growing up? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I had friends growing up, yeah. So you had like, yeah. a, like a stable group of friends? You guys? Yeah. Okay. And we, um, for the most part, we um, didn't do drugs at that point. Like a few of us, a few of them smoked pot, but it was like when we did, it was super regulated, like with the parents there and stuff like that. Like it wasn't, wasn't we weren't sneaking it or anything like that. Same with the drinking. We, we didn't drink very, we didn't, not really any much underage drinking, but when we did, the parents were present at the house and uh, not my parents, but <laughs> their parents were present at the house and it was all regulated and done safely. So you're describing, I mean, probably a childhood that many people can relate to. Um, you know, there's some challenges, but a group of friends um, and maybe an early teenage years starting to experiment with a little bit of pot and alcohol and stuff. Now, where did things go? Uh, where did things when did things become difficult for you in terms of substance use? Uh, um, 
You alluded to hey, opioids earlier. In so my... I moved. So when I when I moved to Vancouver, I got a job in construction. It was hard. Like I was I was small. It was it was a winter season. It was it was it was like raining. Was rain was going up. It was a it was a nasty uh, nasty year. And, and you're still I, young at this point. You're 17 years old. Uh, 17, yeah, yeah. You left your rural community into the big city of Vancouver. Yeah. yeah. And who did you come with? I went with my friend, and he uh, he moved out. He he didn't stay with in the house very long because he was he was chasing a girl, and you know yeah. he had to move in with her. So I just got I just I had uh, someone I didn't really know very well move in, but I didn't really talk to them very much for the, the rest of the time they lived there. They weren't we weren't they didn't. Uh, I wasn't so you're like essentially alone at this point. Is yeah, it? yeah, pretty much. It's just I have a roommate, but I don't really talk to him. Got it. Okay, so, so big city alone, um, and working a difficult job, and and take it from there. Physically difficult job. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, so I needed like I needed some way to feel better at the end of it. Um, the opiate use didn't start for about like, maybe a year or two after the start of that job, but it's like it started with, with pot and then ecstasy and then hallucinogens um then um i met some people through people and then like someone i was really i started to get like i started to get really messed up from construction because it was we were doing things that were like way more than we should be doing on physical for our physical bodies and this i like i didn't even know what opiates were at this point like i like i i knew of them and like oh heroin's bad i never but i didn't know what like like pharmacology of opiates and someone gave me a pill and just said, I, I, and said, oh, it's a painkiller. Take this for your back. And so it was a, it was a dilaudid. And I didn't know what that was. I just, I just took it and I felt great. I felt amazing. And I was just like, oh, great. And it wasn't like immediately like I was hooked, but they were there as many as I wanted when I needed them. This, yeah. this woman had, she just had a supply of them and there, and she was, she was getting them from her doctor and she was, she just had extra and she would just leave them in a bowl there so like when I was when I was sore after work, I started taking them and then taking more and then then um yeah you know you you've touched on a couple of really important points um I, I want to elaborate ask you to elaborate on um actually you know what to be honest I I had forgotten that you had a um uh, what we would call de novo or new onset dilated or hydromorphone use disorder which is interesting on its own but you you mentioned that you needed things to make you feel better. Well, that, yeah, like it was, it was, it was, comp like, um, that was the whole, that was the pot and the ecstasy used for the most part. Um, that, that was at the start. And that's how I met the people that were doing more of the heavy stuff. But, when but you I wasn't, make you sorry? feel better. When you say make you feel better, what are you referring to? Um, I needed an, an outlet, really. Cause like after work, I was like, I was just like drained and I didn't feel like I was going anywhere. I was just, I was making money, but. Like when I you wasn't say drained. Are you, are you talking emotionally? No, just physically, just physically drained. Like uh, then, then we took we, we I found this thing called like ecstasy and MDMA, and all of a sudden, I, like after work, I was someone gave this to me one time, and all of a sudden, I was like ready to go. I was like, oh great, I can enjoy the rest of my my after my night here. And then, um, and you weren't and then, you like you weren't going anywhere. What do you mean by that? Well, like just in life, like I was I, like. Life wasn't kind of turning out the way I wanted it to. Like I, I was originally going to go like now I'm in game design now. That's what I do. I'm a game dev. Back then, that's what I wanted to do. And um, I moved to Vancouver. Like I couldn't afford uh, school, so I just moved to Vancouver because I didn't want to work at a grocery store anymore. Got a job at, in construction, and uh, and then I was just I was just doing labor work, like digging and freaking wheelbarrowing, and it's really not how I wanted life to be. So, okay, so the picture you're, you're painting is um, you're feeling alone, you don't have your friends around you, and you're not feeling fulfilled, you're not where you, you pictured you would be in life, um, you're in this big city, you're still pretty young, I mean, you're still a teenager, um, and you start to find these substances that make much of that go away, I suspect, when you say yeah. you're outlet, you take it, you take MDMA, and, and what do you feel suddenly? I want to go go to the club and go dancing and stuff. I want to actually do things like I I didn't want to I I didn't want to do anything before. It's like I would sit at the I would go to the mall and meet some strangers while we're smoking, and that's how it started. But like I wanted to actually 
start living life and and doing stuff like just just it didn't i wasn't doing much productive but it felt like i was doing stuff that was productive it was just like i felt like i was actually doing more than just going to work every day and uh okay collecting a paycheck got it um so um what you're describing is somebody who might be feeling symptoms of depression not wanting oh, to for, oh for sure yeah like i was i was pretty i was fairly i was fairly depressed yeah and, and what you're describing is maybe coping with that by substance use yeah yeah it was like it was i think it, yeah that's I, I i guess that's just that's kind of what what it what it is it's just it was um I just I just wanted to 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 do something that made me feel like alive again, you know. Like I just felt like I felt like I felt really low like when it was like it was well, just pointless. Yeah, I mean, but, you're painting a, uh, a, a what you know a complex picture, and then there's, there it sounds like there are now multiple factors that are driving you in a particular direction. You know, like from a psychological psychiatric perspective, it sounds like there's some symptoms of depression um from a social perspective you're feeling alone you don't really have many sort of attachments or friends or supports around you um and you start using the mdma and and it's you're coping with some of those symptoms you're you're less alone because now with the with the drug use and this drug using group now you feel connected to other people uh those in the in the uh, context of using mdma a lot of those symptoms during the intoxication phase anyways, will sound like they went away. But there's another complex element that has come into play, which is the physical pain. Yeah. From from the construction work and how hard it is on your body. And that sounds like that's where the opioids, the hydrocarbon yeah. first came in. Yeah, that's when uh, the, I was, it was the people I was around, like one of their one of their older sisters had that bowl of dilatids that she would just willingly give, give out to people. And then um, I got pretty much hooked on those for a while. And then all of a sudden I had to start paying her for them and things like that. And then. So that's interesting. First, you get into Dilaudid for free. Yeah. And then suddenly um, you're hooked on them. When you say you're hooked on them, what happens at this point if you don't use them? Oh, with, oh just withdrawal. I would, I, but I also didn't wait to find out either the very long, like it was, I was pretty adamant that I was going to, I would only go like a day or two without taking them. Okay. but yeah, it was it was withdrawal. I was I was like I couldn't work, or if I did work, it was like it was pathetic. Like I was I was pretty much useless. Describe what what withdrawal feels like. Um, cold and achy, like just freaking, like just. But also, I was always getting the like, sweats. Like I always get the cold sweats, yeah. and um, I like, just just cold and achy and sweating at the same time. Just feeling dirty. Just feeling most mostly like that. Like I need. I haven't had a shower in a year, kind of thing. Nausea and vomiting. Okay. Um, I don't think I ever got that far where I wasn't. You like, didn't. I, you didn't wait to get that bad. No, I didn't wait. I did that thing. I didn't wait to get let it get that bad. I was like before that. I was like, I don't feel good. I need. I need what I need. And it wasn't like that she was like, now you got to buy them. It was just like she had no money and she needed help. So it was just like, can you, like, it was just like, I started helping her out with uh, so, bills and stuff. And and in addition to um, the physical feeling, the physical relief that you're receiving from the opioids, um, did it have a, have a psychological or emotional um, effect on you? Like, did, did you feel better emotionally? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like I was, I was feeling great. Like I was, I was, I would just like, I wouldn't, I didn't really do the other stuff anymore. I would just stay at home and like uh, just watch movies and just be blitzed out of my mind. Um, on the hydromorph on the opioid. On the morph. Yeah. Cause yeah. Cause it was like, yeah, most like, and it was, I think it was just like, yeah, that's what I was doing. And it was fine because, um, uh, I think I also was, I had, um, I think that's the thing is because normally, normally like, if, like nowadays, if I was to do something like that, like even I, I, I think it's because I'm getting older, but back then I could have the more, the hydromorphone and go to work and be fine and be awake all day. So that, I think that's later on what came into play with the cocaine is I couldn't stay awake at work. Um, and so I think then, I was okay, doing so now, you, 
got it. Now you're using more and more hydromorphone. Now you're feeling more drowsy. You yeah. still have to go to work to support your habit. Yeah. So um, uh, you're having to use cocaine at work to stay awake. Yeah. Or um, methamphetamines a bit too. Just anything that was an upper really. So, yeah. Got it. Got it. Um, and then how did that interplay with the psychosis? That I didn't really that this was early on, so I didn't really have the psychosis bad at that point. Like I was, I I can't really, re I don't remember having psychosis until like where it was actually like where I was like I hear people and they're like I need to freaking prep to be and to prepare myself until like 2015, I think. Okay. So that like um. So it's it kind of progressed slowly. It did. I, it what actually happened is a friend a friend um passed away. Okay. Um and uh I thought they were I thought they were still around freaking stalking my house because it was basically I had to cut them out of my life because they were a problem and uh they 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 overdosed and they died and um I felt really guilty about it because I was trying to help them stay away from that like just, like do stuff safely and mm. um like and yeah and i couldn't help them so i yeah, just no. kind of felt guilty about it well i mean you you've i mean done an amazing job painting um again this picture of a kid growing up in rural british columbia just a regular life and how things have progressed to the point and now you're doing cocaine and methamphetamine and opioids now you're having a friend die of overdose now you're experiencing psychosis um so things have, are it sounds like they're spiraling for you yeah. Um so um let's talk about how things progress for towards recovery or maybe when we first met. Do you remember? Yep. <laughs> I remember. Yeah, I remember. I don't forget that. Yeah. Oh. Um it, you came in and you said we want to put you on Suboxone and I said no, I don't want to deal with that crap anymore. And you said what if what if uh, what if it we could be different this time and it was different and uh and i haven't used since i have not uh i have not i i am well i smoke my vape now but i don't i quit cigarettes as well and uh yeah it was oh it's through um through your methods i got um i've been doing great thing i've i finished school i have a lovely fiance and um yeah life is worth living again well, I'm well. I'm glad you're doing so well. Um, but it sound I, I I remember very distinctly meeting you, um, and uh, it seemed to me at that point you you had hit um, a number of difficult things in your life, and and things were I mean I don't want to say rock bottom, but things were were quite difficult. And... I wouldn't say it was rock, that was rock bottom, but that was the moment that I was like, um, I can't do this anymore because like. I think rock bottom was was when I went to when I went to rehab. That was uh, okay. a few years up before that, um, and I got. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to talk about that part at all. Well, you know, um, for the interest of time, I mean, it's, it's all very interesting. But you mentioned something that um, I think it's worth delving into is because you had come in and um, you had had an overdose. Um, and I wanted to put you on opioid agonist therapy. So that's the, that's the, um, medical treatment for opioid addiction. And I, I had recommended buprenorphine or suboxone. Uh, but you had said no, because you'd had a bad experience with suboxone previously. Um, do you want to explain what that bad experience was? The, uh, have, well, uh, the having to go daily to pick up the, the, the the prescription the having to go to the clinics and the, the treatments that I got like it, it felt like I was being treated like a criminal every time I went there and I just like I, I had done that before and like you can't have a job because like that they, they, they're gonna know about it they're gonna know because you have to go every Thursday to a freaking four hour um uh like because like the way it took about four hours of my time to go there because I had to wait in line and and everything like that. But it's like they like my job knew exactly what was going on. It was embarrassing. Like I, I didn't want to deal with that. Yeah. So I remember when I first had um 
met you in in the hospital you had had an overdose and um things uh were pretty bad and we had I had spoken to you about opioid agonist therapy which is the treatment we use to tr the, the medical treatment we use for opioid use disorder essentially you were giving sort of safer, long-acting, very controlled um, opioids to prevent the cravings and withdrawal. The one that I had recommended to you was buprenorphine. Uh, from my perspective, particularly for young people and adolescents, it's the one with the uh, best safety profile as well as um, side effect profile. Um, now, I know, but you had been on this medication previously, and I know there were some challenges um, that you experienced, with, which a lot of people do going on this medication, um, which had which made you not want to go on it again. So I know when you went on it, uh, well, talk about the expe expectation. When you went on it, what, what was the process for you to to safely go on to buprenorphine? Uh, I would, they uh, had me withdraw for three days, um, or not used for three days. Uh, it was, um, I was actually switching from methadone to suboxone at that time. Right. Uh, and, and, and um, so not to cut you off, but that's, that's a very important point because it's a lot to ask for a patient to go into withdrawal for three days. Right. I mean, many of our patients and you described this yourself is at a certain point they're using just to prevent withdrawal and, and withdrawal is such a horrible feeling, but now we're expecting these, you know, we're telling these patients, we have this great treatment, but you have to go into withdrawal for three days. Um, and um, not only that, I mean, there, the whole experience of can be challenging to be involved in a clinic and having to witness and you're in drug screens and et cetera. What was that like for you? Uh, it was it was it was it was really annoying because I'd have to I freaking have to I had a set time that I was supposed to be there. So I'd, ha I'd not be able to go to the bathroom in the morning. So I'd be at work holding it <laughs> because if I go, I won't be able to go then and then it'll take longer. And then I, it was, it would, uh, it, it interfered with my work because every Thursday I had to go to, I had to drive to there and, and it was in a rural, this was back in a rural, the rural area that I grew up in. So I would have to, I'd have to drive there, go and then, and then drive back to the job site. Right. Um, and uh, then I'd have to go early, leave the work early to go pick it up because the pharmacy closes at like six o'clock. Right. Um, luckily I had a really great pharmacist that was, that would do, that did everything in, in their power to make it easier for me and less embarrassing and always have it ready when I need it. Like, like when they, they, I never had to ask, it was always ready when I wanted it, uh, or not when I wanted it, when I, when they, like, when it was supposed to be ready, like as soon as I got the prescription, they'd fill it right away and it'd be there waiting for me. Um, but, uh, and in in vancouver it's not quite like that it's it's even even now it's still a pain to get the, the prescription filled and luckily yeah. i only have to do that once a month yeah um but now but but if you remember the way we st i started buprenorphine for you i did it through this oh, process yeah. called microdosing right where we kept you in hospital and we we i can't remember which protocol specifically we use but there was not the expectation that you would go into withdrawal um, and be abstinent for three days to get on to the medication. No, I think I, um, no, I, you just, I was given like, I think a two milligram tablet just right at the start. Um, but they, they said it'd been long enough because like that I was out, um, I was in the hospital, I think three days at that point. So I think when hospital, three days, since right. the, I think it was so, two or three days since the overdose. Yeah, no, exactly. And so what we did was, I think you were still receiving opioids to prevent withdrawal, but we gave you small doses and we, we very quickly ramped it up the dose to get you to a comfortable dose. Yeah. Um, and, but it was interesting that the, 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 I remember there was a switch with you from going absolutely not screw off. To, <laughs> I don't know if you remember to, to accepting it. What was that? Do you, I mean, it's been a while now, but do you, do you in, recall the reason that this time was different and you accepted the treatment because you didn't make me go to the clinic all the time and do all the the um all the all the, the, the stuff that made it uncomfortable like going to the clinic having the yeah the, the, the reception is just like looking at you like you're a piece of shit and like having like it right. just all right. that stuff you we, we just didn't have to do it and, and if it just felt like I was on a, it, it let me, I was just on a prescription now. That's it. It wasn't a freaking 
like sentence of you have to, it wasn't like an extra job like the way it was before like before it was like a job to do it to just to get a prescription and i didn't want to deal with that no i'd rather have just gone cold turkey i get it and you know um not to belabor this point too much but i think we expect a lot from our patients sometimes and this especially that when 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 patients are daily witnessing now and i get it there's a certain you know there's a reason for that and and there's a place for it but um I think what what happened was I, I painted a picture for you that was going to be just like you said, just another prescription for you to treat um, this condition. Um, so we did that. We got you on Suboxone. And um, there was another important component, another important factor um, that in the room that day, which I think was 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 a big reason uh, has been a big reason behind your success yeah and that uh, was uh i would say my family and my fiance for absolutely like the the support system um they made it actually it's it's actually been fairly easy uh, since that day because i had i had always had she, she's always been here so like she's always with me when i go downtown she's all like she um like it's any time that i'm I'm having like psych like psychosis. I can talk to her about it. It's right. like it 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 makes it it it. I'm doing actively doing things to prevent that spiral. Um, right. mm-hmm. um, because mostly because I'm not alone. Right. So I, I was, That's so key. You're not alone. I mean, you weren't alone in the room that day. Your dad was at your bedside. Your fiance came to your bedside, and you're not alone now. And I think that. It, I'm not to speak for you, but I feel like that is such an important factor. Oh, it, it is the factor. <laughs> like, it, there's no doubt about it. I don't think I'd be. I don't think I would have gotten here at all without them. Yeah, and but you're also receiving medications for the psychosis. Yeah, and that's actually going pretty good. Like, uh, we, we we've we've I've upped it to basically to four milligrams of Abilify a day, and um, yeah, it's 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 getting more manageable. Like, it's good. it's like half or less of than what it was like a few months ago so, so it is helping and and so you alluded to this already but how's life now what have you accomplished since since that day in the hospital oh, I, I finished school um i'm 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 looking to get uh a job like a, a, a more stable job but i'm doing i'm doing like compositing and editing and uh some 3d work and game dev stuff and uh that's what i always wanted to do like uh, I don't have to do backbreaking work to just be able to support myself, and and uh, yeah, like things are things are like starting to turn into what I really wanted to be like when I was back in high school. So, and last time you used was uh, last time I used was the day before uh, the, the the overdose night. So those that was the last time, and then uh, yeah, we came when we came back after my dad's like, where is it? And I showed him, and he flushed it. <laughs> and that's like a show, and yeah. that's last time I saw that stuff. And we talked about that. Um, well, listen, um, I just want to summarize because you brought up some really important points, and you just just a beautiful job of uh, of um, walking us through your journey. Um, but again, just to summarize, I mean, just starting out, just a kid in rural. BC community growing up with all the usual pressures of, of being a kid, um, really smart kid who um, struggled with some ADHD, had friends, etc. But it, it's it seems like things started to get bad when you had moved out of that circumstance where you had all your supports and friends. Now you're feeling alone. You don't have anybody around you. You um, you're not where you wanted to be in life, um, and um, you're feeling alone. And you you're you don't, you're looking for a community, and you're looking for an outlet, like you said yourself, from all of that negativity. And you meet a group of people that are using, and you start using, and you feel fantastic. Yeah, I just want to point out that it was a lot of it. It's not just a lone thing. It's not having goals, yeah. not having something that I'm working towards was also it too. But yeah. that that came with um being alone it's like a, it's alone and no direction as yeah, well. yeah yeah and you said it yourself that um but when you use things were a lot different you were it was an outlet it was an escape from, from yeah the, escape for sure yeah yeah yeah, yeah. From, from those emotions from, from the feelings of depression but then um 
one thing leads to another and then you have the physical pain and then the hydromorphone comes into play and now you're physically addicted and now you're needing to stay awake to work. So now you're using more stimulants, more co- you're using cocaine, methamphetamine, you're getting psychotic and it and was, then there's it was it got into intravenous and just like it just got worse. Yeah. It's just yeah. spiraling. Um yeah. friend died of an overdose. You had an overdose yourself, but I think at the same time, the things that helped you pull out of this situation, I mean your hard work, hundred percent pharmacotherapy so the suboxone has been key and and the medications for the psychosis so treating the underlying mental illness was key treating the physiological addiction the biological component was really important with suboxone but equally important you're at this you're suddenly not alone now now you have your mommy at your side you have your fiance at your side um and now you have goals which were to become a programmer and you're entering in school and um, I think all of those came in, came in, came together for you to be able to achieve your goal and, and have this period of abstinence. So, um, yeah, really rewarding to hear this story, you know, like, um, our job, you know, it can be challenging and, you know, at, at, at the darkest times when things go really bad, um, it's, it's like patients like you that, that I think about and, and remind myself why I'm doing this work. So you're like one of my bright stars when things are really bad. So, so. Um, thank you for all your hard, hard work. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Really appreciate it. Okay. And thank you for sharing. I think we'll leave it there. Um, and um, best of luck to all your endeavors in the future. And um, and hopefully we'll have a chance to do something like this again in the future. Yeah, no problem. It was great. And thanks for thanks for letting me speak. Appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay. And, and again to the conference. And the audience, um, thank you so much. Um, it, it's it's been a privilege and an honor to be able to share um, with the conference today, and um, and um, I think we'll just sign it off here. Um, Nicholas, one last question I wanted to ask you before um, we sign off is, um. At the time when you started using hydromorphone, um, let's just say hydromorphone was not available to you, but fentanyl was. Would you have gone ahead and and used fentanyl? Probably. You would have probably. I would have tried to do it. I would have. I would have scientifically done it, and I would have. I would have um, probably like put it into water. And like separated it out so I could measure just so I would like I would do all the stuff to make sure that it was safe, but I would that I would totally have done it. Yeah. This that's interesting. Okay. Thank you. Um